So it means that he will start the, the scientific part and then we proceed as planned. Okay? So I will therefore now um, start sharing the first session, which is called Cellular Systems. And uh, the first speaker will be senior lecturer Dominic Chu, who works at the University of Kent in the United Kingdom. He investigates the potential for biology based on molecular com bio computing by studying information processing in living systems. And the title of his presentation is The Stochastic Nature of Living Systems. So please, Dominic. Um, do we have a pointer here? This? Yeah. And how do I change? Yeah. So thank you very much uh, for the invitation here. Um, I'm also very happy that I'm speaking first because I guess um, a lot of these things I'm going to talk about are not particularly applied, so I feel more um, like a scientist at heart rather than a technologist or, or even a computer scientist. Um, so, but still, I think that um, what I'm going to talk about is quite relevant to, to many of you here. So, um, the, the title here is Stochastic Behavior and Biology, and I think we all know that uh, biological systems are stochastic, so they are, there's a lot of noise in there. What I think is probably not that clear to many of you is what's the relationship between the stochastic behavior, the ability of the system to compute, as I would call it, or probably as many of you would call it, to regulate internal cell processes and associated costs. So this is what I'm going to talk about and trying to tickle out a little bit. And the first part of my talk is very much focused on um, giving you a review over things that are fairly well known. And, and it's probably a little bit more than the first part. And I'm doing this so there are no, there, there I claim no novelty, there I claim no, um, no, 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 or the, hardly any insights of my, myself there. Um, and only in the second part I then, I then get to some research I've done two years ago, um, which looks at the particular biological example. Uh, and I will go fairly quickly over this. Um, let us start with this. So um, stochastic behavior. So, so where does the noise in biology come from? And basically, um, this is very simple because life is a bunch of reactions, a bunch of chemical or biochemical reactions. And molecular re reactions are intrinsically stochastic. These are um, just some types of stochastic processes. And so you get this variation naturally. What you do not get naturally is um, deterministic behavior. So that's something that we, that we expect, or have to really expect, simply because life is chemical. So, Noise in biology is not always a bad thing, and there are many examples of cells that, or systems, um, biological systems that exploit um, noise. So, for example, um, we have phase variation in, in, in bacteria. These are um, mechanisms to evade um, the host immune system. Those exploit the, 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 the variation or the stochasticity in the cell, spirulation, bat hatching um, strategies, and so on. But very often, also, the cell at least that's how we interpret it, wants to um, compute a particular outcome. And in this case, um, the cell probably wants to, or, or, or it would be better for the cell, um, to behave deterministically. And, and these examples are translation or, or um, sensing. So translation where you want to turn an mRNA message into, into an into a, um, uh, protein, they don't want to make many mistakes. And their noise is a problem. Uh, gene regulation, well, at least some types of gene regulation in, in some contexts, there also you would expect that you have an environment, the cell wants to adapt itself to this particular environment, uh, and it wants to do so as accurately as possible. And the question now is, can cells do this? And um, here, this is um, a little graph I have done some time ago that shows the, the, the fundamental problem we have there, or not we, but the cell has it. So what I did here is I looked at, the, at a, a single gene, and this gene can be switched on or off by the environment. And the question now I ask, how fast can the gene switch from on to off? And this is some... Um, 
Um, this here is in, in, in some units the, the time it takes to switch. And then we have here the x axis and the y axis here record the accuracy with which it can switch. So whether or not when we have a certain environmental condition, we actually get the the, the correct answer that we want. And the more noise we have, the less accuracy we have. And what you see here is that there's a trade-off between the ability of the gene to switch fast in this direction, uh, or rather in this direction, and the accuracy with which the cell can switch. So we have a problem there. If cells want to switch fast, want to react fast to external um, reactions, uh, to, to external changes in the external environment, um, then they have to be inaccurate. Or if they want to do it slowly, then they can be more accurate in their reaction. So if you want to change this, if you want to increase both um, the switching time and the accuracy, what you have to do is you have to invest, and that's the point of the talk, I'm going to label this a lot here now, then you have to invest more energy. You have to consume more ATP, you have to eat more food and so on. So there's then what you then get for the cell evolutionarily is a trade-off between its ability to switch and its ability to and, and its, its its ability to to, to econ be economical. Um, right. So the question now is, where does all this come from, from a fundamental point of view? So I mean, this this trade-off between uh, between accuracy and 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 um, energy usage, and it turns out that there are very basic physical principle principles that dictate this here. And um, one famous one in um, in, in this actually comes from, well, I wouldn't say computer science, but, but f statistical physics, rather, information thermodynamics is the famous Landauer principle. And what this says is that if you're a system and you want to um, destroy, and, uh, destroy information, and destroying information really means that you have something random and it makes it slightly less random, then if you want to do one bit, if you want to destroy one bit, then this costs you a certain amount of work. And this is this KB, so Boltzmann constant, temperature, and Allen 2. And this is a fundamental limitation that Landau found. Uh, and you can think about this a little bit more, and then you find that in biology, there are many applications of this, and that um, there are a number of um, biological processes that you can interpret in this way. And uh, things that necessarily have to cost you work or energy are things like switching to a particular state. So not switching itself. So you may be uh, stochastically switching between two states. That can be done for free. But if you say, I want to always be in state one, I always want to be in state on, or always be in state off, then you can only do so by paying a certain amount of energy penalty. Measuring concentrations or copying polymers are other examples. So what you do when you measure a uh, concentration of the external environment, for example, you want to know how much um, um, how much molecule or how much um, nutrient is out there, then what you in essence do is, as the cell, is that you, 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 um, um, you, in, you establish a correlation between yourself and the uh, environment, and in terms of stati statistical physics, this would mean um, that you, you take yourself away from, from equilibrium further away, and this costs. So, and we, we're seeing this in biology all the time that whenever you want to measure something or when you want to copy something or when you want to switch to a particular state, then you have to pay. But let me now go to, away from biology for a moment and look at the system that's very well known in computer science and I think has also um, gained some, some, some recognition outside. And this is the Turing machine. The Turing machine um, is a is one, but probably the best known model of computation. And what it in essence is, it's some sort of reading head, and this runs around along a tape, and depending on the contents of the tape, there's some information written on the tape, and it goes left or right, changes its internal state, and then, um, 
at some point stops, and when it stops, then the computation is finished. Now, I like this picture very much because it, you could, if you, if, you, if you wouldn't know, I took this somewhere from Wikipedia here, but if you wouldn't know, it's a Turing machine. It could be a ribosome here that, that runs around, along an mRNA. And so it, it looks all very biological here. Um, but, but, so computer scientists are very interested in Turing machines because they are a, a model of computation. But now, um, when, when we think of this more as a biological system or as something that could be a biological system, then we want to ask the following question. Now, if a Turing machine is in some state here and then our program says it has to go right next, how is that possible? How can it go right? Now, a computer scientists would never worry about this. They just say, well, it goes right and then does something. But um, as biologists, you would know this doesn't work unless we put some energy in. So you put some ATP in. So, or um, if you're more a physicist, then you would say, well, we have to put a battery into a, into a Turing machine so it can deterministically go from one part of the tape to the, to the next one. Probably somewhat closer to your heart, although it may not seem so at first, is this system here. Now, logicians and computer scientists like to play very much with formal systems. And what this is, is in essence, you make up a bunch of symbols and then you say, with my symbols, I have my inference rules. And I just say, I could just make up whatever I want. So in this case here, I have these, these well, whatever they are called, this symbol. These two symbols, whenever they are together, they become this triangle, and this triangle then becomes this, and so on. So these inference rules. They are just, just formal systems that you write down, and you can do whatever you want with them. Um, so, and then what we can do, we can then start with axioms, and then using these axioms, we can improve theorems. And computer scientists and, and mathematicians and logicians like this very much. And now you wonder why is this closer to your heart. Now, let's look a little bit at these first two uh, inference rules. They may seem familiar to you. And then we can ask the question, how can we implement them as a biologist? And you would now immediately, probably half of the room now jumps up and says, well, this is completely unrealistic biologically. Because it looks very much like this sort of reaction. And we have an enzymatic reaction here, where we have some, some enzyme and some substrate A that's converted to C, and it becomes E. And then the enzyme is, the enzyme is recovered, plus we have some other product. And this would be. Oh, exactly this reaction here, right? The only problem is that um, enzymatic reaction that go only in one direction, they are not allowed. They always have to be reversible. So what this tells us, if we, want to, if we have a computation and we want to implement this using molecules, then we cannot necessarily do this. And in fact, if we have this, if we're in equilibrium here, um, then we cannot actually um, implement this inference rule at all because, as you see, there is no reverse inference, inference rule here. So we cannot go back from this to here in our formal system. But in a biological system, we have to do that. It's simply not allowed to, to go just one way. So what we can do, of course, and you will all know this, is we can, we can bias our um, our, our, our enzymatic reaction by coupling it to, a, to, a, to a, a second reaction that's far out of equilibrium, and then we get uh, perhaps a strong bias in the direction from, from A to B. But there will always be a chance to go back. So the reason why I tell you this is because I want to, I want to, I want to illustrate here that there's a close connection between biology um, noise and noise in this case manifests itself just in, in, in this unpredictability in which these, these, these reactions go, uh, and computation. And computation should be important for all of you because many of you, I'm sure, are interested in manipulating um, molecular systems and cells to do what you want. So, and that, in essence, is a computation. Um, Right. So now, more formally now, um, we can also write down what the cost is of biasing um, a reaction in one particular um, direction. And, uh, well, at least a part of this cost is, is given by this expression here. Well, I just take here the simplest reaction that we have. We have A goes to B and B goes to A. Uh, and then each time this reaction is, is uh, in this case, in the forward direction, we 
produce this entropy here. So that depends on the logarithm of the ratio of the um, um, of the um, uh, reaction rates. Uh, and what you see here is that um, if we have a direction that just goes in, 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 if we have a reaction that goes just in one direction, then our entropy production would be infinite. And that's, of course, something that is physically, well, probably impossible to realize. Now, um, let me go one step further here. And, and show you a, a, a very old, a, this is taken from a very old paper from 1982, a classical one by Charles Bennett, who is a computer scientist for, for IBM. And he, he took these, these analogy between biology and computer science even further, but took it in the other way, where he showed that he can build um, a, um, uh, a Turing machine, a Turing machine, a Turing machine um, out of biological components only. So he didn't actually implement this, but he showed how you would do this using, using known biological reactions. So there's a very close connection between computation, stochasticity, and biology. Now, within biology, um, people have thought about this, but have thought about this in a very limited context. And one of the examples that have been um, very popular um, for those interested in computation and biology is, is, is sensing. So, um, and the idea of sensing, as you all know, is, 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 is that cells, they want to gain information about the environment. Say, um, you want to know um, what nutrients are out there so you know which genes to express. Or another example that has been very popular here is um, uh, gradient sensing during chemotaxis, and you can easily interpret this as a computation and then calculate the costs of this. So people have done this. And uh, the classical result here goes back to 77, actually, which shows fundamental limitations on the accuracy that the cell, uh, with which a cell can determine external um, concentrations. Um, but there has been, and this is the point here of these, uh, um, of these references here to show you that there's been some recent work that, that improved this and showed how these fundamental limits can be approached only in the limit of um, very expensive measures that the, that the cell takes. Um, so sensing has been some sort of paradigm case for computation in, in, in biological systems. Um, but I've been interested myself in a slightly different sort of um, example for computation. Um, this is also a, a, a classical system here um, that I was interested in, and this is deoxygrowth or the, or the glucose effect. So those of you who are biologists, I'm sure you have learned this uh, in your first year at university as a sort of paradigmatic um, example for gene regulation. And the idea is the following, that we have bacteria, and these bacteria, they are, they are grown in, in a... In a, in a I've never been in a lab myself, but I imagine this is some sort of bottle and you dilute the bacteria there uh, and you stir them a lot and you, the crucial part is that you, um, um, you give them two sorts of nutrients. I call them primary nutrient and secondary nutrient, but biologists, when they work with um, E. coli, they sometimes call it glucose and lactose or glucose and xylose or whatever. So the point is, one, the primary nutrient is a good one that enables the cell to grow fast. The second one is good as well, enables, to grow, enables the cell to grow fast as well, but a bit, little bit less so. So it's not quite as desirable. So when I, when I talk about this with my computer science, colleagues and I always say it's a little bit if you are at the conference like this, you have a table full of pizza and a table full of carrots, then all the, what happens, all the computer scientists go for the pizza and eat the pizza first, and then they wait a bit and hope that more pizza comes when there's no pizza coming to go for the carrots and eat that if they're still hungry. And um, bacteria do exactly the same thing here. We have here, if we have here, ignore the numbers here, they are just made up. As I said, I'm not actually dealing with real um, living things, at least not with bacteria. Um, so if we have, we have here the, uh, the, some measure of growth, so the optical density perhaps um, of our bacterial population, we have here time, and what we get here, we get a period of um, exponential growth. Uh, 
and this exponential growth uh, correlates to glucose being consumed. Then we get another period of exponential growth over here where our population consumes the lactose. Uh, and most crucially, we have then in between um, a state, um, um, a phase which is called the lag phase, where the bacteria do not grow at all. Well, so we believe. Um, so it makes very much sense, of course, that um, as our computer science friends do this, that we eat our pizza first and only then go for the carrots when we know that there's nothing there. So sequential uptake of nutrients when one is better than the other is a, an evolution, is a strategy where you can understand why it happens. What is much more difficult to understand is why there's this lag phase here. So um, bacteria, they usually don't wait for glucose to come because they, they don't think that much. Um, but um, they still stop to grow. And the question is, why do they stop to grow? Evolutionarily, um, this doesn't make much sense, because um, if I stop growing, um, what is happening then is that um, I don't um, produce any babies, and um, if there is a mutation, somebody else grows, continues um, his um, exponential growth, produces lots of bacteria babies, will outperform me. So the hypothesis then is, and that's what I was thinking there, um, that this has to do with the computational cost of switching between two nutrients. So it, it doesn't, it, the idea is that you don't switch very fast because switching fast costs, because it's a computation that you have to do and the computation costs. Um, and um, for this reason, it, it, it may be a better idea to just not grow for some time here. So let's look at this in some more detail here. Well, first, um, there was some recent experimental work that looked a little bit in more detail of what's actually happening um, in, these, um, in these lag phase here where, where supposedly nothing happens, and it turns out that actually a lot of things happen because bacteria are stochastic systems, so what, when you look closer and do single cell measurements, you find that some bacteria, um, they keep growing there, and, 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 and some switch to the wrong nutrients, some switch in the right direction, so there's a lot of things going on. Uh, so there is stochastic, um, stochastic behavior that manifests itself, where you don't see it, it at the population level, but at the single cell level you do see it. Um, and what, you also, what, what they also notice is, and that's what be my expectation, that these, these lag phase here, so the length of the no growth, is actually under evolutionary control. So in the lab you can do artificial evolution and you can make this larger and short, longer and shorter depending on the conditions. Um, so my, my um, contact lens starts to plague me now. Um, this is unpleasant a bit. Um, so, um, and one of, the, one of the things that I just want to mention here, there are, there are lots of results they had, experimental results, but one of the important ones here is that they found that um, cells, um, what's important, an important determinant for the, for the lag phase is actually not how fast the cells, individual cells actually switch, um, but the important thing is here um, at what point they start to switch. So they, some cells start to switch when the first, the glucose, is already very low, and it turns out that when this is the case, then the lag phase is very long, but others start to switch very, very early when there's still a lot of glucose around, and in this case then, um, uh, the lag phase is um, um, very, um, very short. So, um, in essence, just I want to preempt it is my results, just in case I don't get to the end, which um, is possible here. Um, what what, what I, I am going to show you now is a math mathematical model of this. And, what this math and it's a very simple and minimal mathematical model. And what this math mathematical model will show is that, that dioxid growth is, in essence, actually a sensing problem. Um, so you wouldn't think this at first, but once you start to write down the equation, it turns out this is nothing but sensing, actually. Uh, and it also turns out that a very, very minimal, minimal model can reproduce um, almost all of these, these, these stochastic effects um, that have been, um, have been found quite recently on, on, on this system. And, and that's the, the more or less the thing that I, it's most important for me here is that um, the reason for the, for the lag phase is that efficient sensing, and that's roughly accurate computation, comes at the cost in terms of energy, and it comes at the cost in terms of energy 
all the time. So if you want to switch rapidly to lactose, say, you have to pay this cost always, even if there's no lactose around. And hence, there's a trade-off for the cell between switching fast, so doing rapid computation in this case, but that comes at the permanent cost. And it has to trade it off against the, the advantage it has when, when, when there's actually glucose and lactose uh, in the environment, which may not be uh, the case so often. So, and here is my imagination of this system. So this is a, a simplified model of the phosphotransfer system, and I've simplified this so I can, I can put this into an equation here. And let me just talk you through this briefly. Is, so we have um, glucose import through some, through some glucose-specific porins, and then we have um, when a glucose uh, molecule is imported here, then we have some repressor which I call R, and this is dephosphorylized here. And the dephosphorylized form is active within the cell. What it does is it interacts with um, lactose um, porins and in essence prevents them from functioning, so it blocks them. Um, what we also have is um, a gene here um, the red one, and this gene produces the lactose um, porins, uh, and this is activated by lactose within the cell. I know this is not completely correct, but the, the basic idea is, is, is I think, um, sound here. Um, so what we get in there is a system, and this is a very common reg regulation motif um, in, in, in bacteria, but what you get here is that um, in order to, to, to be able to, uptake, to take up um, lactose, we need to have lactose in the cell. So that's what computer scientists would call a deadlock. So no lactose, no ability to take up lactose. So in, in a sense, you starve in a sea of nutrient. But of course, we know that this is not the case. But what happens in reality is that we have some stochastic or leak expression of these um, lactose porins. And this stochastic expression of leak expression, um, this is um, in a way the sensor. Because once we get here um, a little bit of lactose um, expressed, then lactose comes into the system and, and, and starts a positive feedback, which competes with this antagonistic um, um, action of, of the glucose uptake system here. Um, so what I will assume now, and this is, I think, also somewhat realistic, is that all we need to know in order for this feedback to start here, for the, for the lactose activation to start, is we need a certain threshold number of, um, uh, of uh, lactose porins. And once we have those, then the system gets started. And. Um, now I want to know how this precisely works. So I write down an equation. We don't need to worry about that. I just write this down because you know it looks pretty, and um, we can make this then a little bit simpler. So we can do something with this, and we don't need to worry about this. But what I want you to worry about here is just the 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 the, the meaning of the symbols here, which I'm going to use now when I show you the results. So we have n here, and n here is the number of the lac permeases. So these 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 porins that I was talking about. Um, and we have R, and R stands for the number of repressors. And that really is, in the system I have, is a, is a, is a, um, 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 is a proxy for the glucose uptake rate. Um, and then we have K2 here, and by K2, I mean the leak rate. And what this leak rate here is, in a computational context, it really is the sampling rate with which your, your sensor sam pings the environment. So is the lactose? Ding, is the lactose, ding, is the lactose, ding, and so on. And depending on the frequency, um, the, your system is more or less efficient. And what's very important as well, since this is a leak expression, this comes at a cost, because you have to, you have to produce at least one permeas in order to ping. So, so each event, each of these leak events here costs you, costs you directly ATP, but it costs you also, when you look at this, this is pro most likely also a fact that it costs you, it costs you real estate on your self-surface because you're competing. It's not just this system there, but there are many others. There's limited amount of space on, on your self-surface, so you can't express all too many of those. Um, so, so this is your cost. And then you, 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 we, you can use these equations. And then what I really wanted to do, I wanted to ask two questions because that's in order to stay in my computational um, 
um, theme here and, and these questions are, the first one is, how reliable is my computation? So what is the probability that the lack metabolism is switched on given a certain amount of glucose? So we have glucose still in the environment. If we assume we have very much, then it's probably not turned on because it's, it's re repressed. But if we have very little, then it's probably already turned on. So we want to understand that. The second question, but that's static. The second question is, how long does it take for my system to switch on? So let's assume we are now in a situation where we suddenly know there's no glucose or very little. How long does it take for me um, to switch my luck on? And that's, of course, directly related to my um, well, not that, of course, but well, just trust me for the moment. It is related um, to the uh, to the length of the lag phase. Um, so, and graphically here, just to to illustrate this 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 activation time, what, the way I imagine this is that we have here n again our number of um, um, lag permeases, and then um, time goes from top to bottom. And then what we assume here is that we have here some, some threshold, this is the dotted line, and then we go over this threshold at some point, we stay on, 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 and we go off, and my switching time is this. And that's, of course, the stochastic time. But what I can do is I can calculate um, things like um, the average or the mean um, length to switch here. But I don't do this quite now. So first, the first question is the, the shape of the probability. So here I have um, um, slightly mislabeled here. That should be R here. And here is my probability of being turned off. Uh, so this, in essence, tells you how much glucose there is in the system. And this tells you what's your probability that the lactose is turned off. And then you know when there, you see when there is very little glucose, then your probability is, is low to be turned off. And here it's almost one. And what we do have is we have an area of uncertainty in between. And this is what I call delta R here. And this is a surprisingly, by the way, surprisingly simple formula which you get here. Um, but that's, so this is my probability or my, my um, um, my, my accuracy I can define here. What I, what I can do here now is this is also, you can calculate this exactly, I just noticed this is not very visible here, is that you can plot your, your switching time or the inverse of the switching time as a function of this K2. And remember this K2 was, was the leak expression. This is directly related to cost. And this is also the frequency with which I ping the environment. And what you see there is as your cost goes up, your inverse time goes up. So in other words, if you want to switch fast, you have to, you have to, spend, you have to spend on this K2. So switching fast is expensive here. Um, and um, you can then do a few more things with the, um, with, with the system, since it's a very simple, um, just stochastic system that can be calculated very well. What you then can also calculate is then if we, if we fix a certain threshold here and we fix a, um, we say we want to spend so and so much um, on our sensing system, then you can calculate um, the point, uh, the amount of glucose almost here um, at which um, your system um, will start to switch from, um, from turn on to turn off. And what this shows here is, this is precisely what they found previously in the paper and I talked about is that if you want to switch fast here, then um, you have to, if you want to switch fast, then um, you, have to, you have to start to, to, to switch to, to the lactose at very high amounts of glucose. And what that means is if you want to switch very fast, then you, you really have to, have to have to switch to the carrots much earlier and take the things that are not as good for you um, and for your growth. Um, but but, but and, and there's the trade-off here between between the, the, the ability to react rapidly, but then also you start to become very inefficient uh, in your uh, exploitation of the environment. Um, I wonder how much time do I have left? Yeah, so I'm I'm almost finished anyway. Um, so I want to just come to my conclusions here, and that is I hope that I could illustrate or indicate to you, 
at least, that stochastic behavior, computation, regulation, and cost, those things are intimately related to one another. And this is very, very relevant in many biological contexts. Now, I didn't talk about this but here, but um, uh, one of the inspirations for, for this whole um, um, research interest I have actually comes from something that's probably more related to what you're doing because I've been involved in, in, in a collaboration where we looked at um, um, how um, um, recombinant gene expression affects cell health. And um, so the, the, the idea there came very much from industry where they were worried that when we, when we put in all these genes that are expressed at a very high level, uh, then we get probably high expression rates, but we also get poor product quality. And the, the reason the, was that the, this recombinant uh, gene expression um, takes so much um, um, resources from the cell that it's no longer able to, to regulate its normal um, um, uh, systems internally well enough and, and altogether the, the, the um, quality suffers. And I'm very happy to and very willing to discuss this with you in, if you have um, uh, in, in, in the context of your specific um, project or answer any questions now, perhaps. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dominic. We are a little bit over time, but I think still I would open for if there are at least one question from the audience. Anyone? Oh, I, have, I have one small comment, because I think it was interesting. You said the evolutionary rationale for the lag phase of microorganism is unclear. I really thought that any bacterium under any condition to try, struggle to keep it as short as possible. Yeah, but th this is not the case. And, and actually, when you, when you look at it, um, so th what, what people normally would say is that this is an adaptation to multinutrient environments. Mm. But it turns out it's quite the opposite. That when you have, when you consistently, if you are in a bacterium and you're in an environment that consistently um, sees multinutrients, so always glucose and lactose, you would, and that has been experimentally shown, I can also show it in, in, in computer simulation, then you have an evolutionary pressure that the lag phase goes to almost zero. Uh -huh. So this is actually an adaptation to seeing sometimes, but very rarely, these conditions. Yeah, so. Okay, thanks. Thank we have you. a gift for you. Thanks very much. Oh, thank you. Okay, then we proceed with the program, and our next speaker will be Professor Vera van Noort, originally from Netherlands, I learned yesterday, but now working at the university in Leuven in Belgium. Her research group, Computational Systems Biology, are focused on how to understand biological systems as a whole. And the title of your presentation, Function, and evolution of short plant peptides. So please, Vera. Thank you. And you have this. Yes. So thank you for the introduction. Um, so my talk will be very different <laughs> from the previous one. Uh, no, not one single uh, mathematical formula. Um, so. Today I will um, talk about short plant peptides and um, mainly about the function and a little bit about the, about the evolution. How does this work? Can I? How does it work to switch the slides? Ah, okay, I have it. Okay. So, what are short peptides? Um, so, in the cell, we have transcript, transcripts and um, we have messenger RNAs, but also other RNA species. And for a long time, it has been believed that the RNAs that only contain short open reading frames, that they would not be translated. Um, but more recently, 
it has become clear that even these RNAs that only encode very short open reading frames, they are sometimes translated and then gives rise to, to very short peptides. And what do I mean by short peptides? Peptides that really consist of 10 to 100 amino acids. And so, but these have been ignored in the genome annotation um, because of a because of a signal to noise ratio. What does that mean? If we have a um, if we have a coding gene, we always have codons, position one, two, three, one, two, three, etc. Now, if we count how many A's, C's, G's, and T's are in this in these first positions. Um, then we can see that there's a, there's a difference between those uh, three positions. Now, if we have a long enough sequence, yeah, but like more than uh, 300 bases or encoding more than 100 amino acids, we can use computational methods to recognize aha, we have a coding gene here. Yeah? Um, but if this is too short, we cannot recognize, we, cannot re we do not have enough signal to actually see that this is a coding gene, yeah, because we cannot distinguish that there is um, uh, a higher percentage of uh, Cs in that, in that position or, uh, or a lower percentage of, of Ts in the first position if the, if the sequence is too short. So therefore, um, when we annotate genomes, we usually ignore everything that is shorter than 100 amino acids. But that doesn't mean that they are non-existent. So there are actually um, RNAs that, uh, that are translated into these short peptides. Now, we did a study in mycoplasma. Oh, go back. Uh, in mycoplasma, that is a small bacterium. And because you may think, well, these may be translated, but that doesn't mean that they are actually functional, right? They can be translated by accident just because they're around. Um, so what we did here was a study where we studied the essentiality of different parts of the genome. And how was this done? It was by inserting elements into all the genes randomly. Now, if you do this a lot of times, then uh, if a gene is not essential, you will many times see an insertion in such a gene. Whereas if it's essential, you will never see such an insertion in, in the gene. And now, if we look at classical open readings frames, how we have annotated them um, for decades, then we see in mycoplasma that is a very small bacterium, about half of the protein coding genes are essential. Yeah? And, and the other half are, are non-essential or it looks like maybe under some conditions they are needed. If we look at non-coding RNAs, that does not include tRNAs or uh, ribosomal, but other non-coding RNAs, usually these are not essential. Yeah? So the functional RNAs, the tRNAs, the ribosomal RNAs, those are often also essential. Now, if we look at these small open reading frames, these open reading frames smaller than 100 amino acids, we also see that half of them are uh, actually essential. Yeah? So this made us think that, no, this is not by accident that they are translated. Actually, they, these are doing something. Yeah? If you would delete them, the, the organism doesn't survive. Now, also, so this was in a bacterium. Now, also in plants, there have been several studies. And this is a study of a, of, oh, of a very short peptide, only 10 amino acids. And... Um, so here, something else was done. This was expressed in the context of Candida albicans. So this peptide is derived from the genome of Arbidopsis thaliana. And if you express it in the con context of Candida albicans, it interferes with biofilm formation. 
So here, and, and that's in a concentration dependent matter. So, so here's how much um, biofilm is formed and the concentration of this um, small peptide. So that means the, these, these kind of short peptides can have an effect and, and can be, in this case, important for the plant. Um, also, other people have studied or have identi identified these short peptides, and this is again in Arabidopsis. So here you have a, a wild type Arabidopsis, and if you overexpress uh, some of these short peptides, you get uh, different phenotypes like strange um, flowers or uh, not much growth or elongated leaves. So they are they also uh, change the phenotype of the plant if they are overexpressed. So the main um, questions for my research is really these short peptides, um, are these functional, you know, each of the individual ones, and what are the molecular functions? So what do they do? You know, if we see a phenotype, how does that um, come about? And um, in this study, we, we looked at Arbidopsis and we looked at oxidative stress in Arbidopsis. So how do we get oxidative stress? Um, uh, by, by reactive uh, oxygen uh, species, and those can be induced either by uh, this herbicide, pyrocot, or by infection uh, with a fungus. Yeah? They both induced a, an oxidative uh, stress response. And a lot of things, um, a lot of things happen. If we induce oxidative stress, and we can measure this by, um, for example, tiling arrays or RNA sequencing, and then we see transcriptionally active regions, and specifically transcriptionally active regions that do not overlap with any of the annotated protein coding genes. Yeah. So we collect evidence for novel short open reading frames um, by these tiling array uh, measurements and also RNA-seq, paradigm sequencing, and um, we find a lot of transcriptionally active regions, again, not overlapping uh, with the classical genome annotation. Now, to get peptides, we need to translate them, but we, of course, do not know in which frame they should be translated. Yeah? So they, there can be different reading frames. So what we simply do is make six-frame translations of all those transcriptionally active regions. And now to one of the things we do to figure out if these are, these are functional is to do homology searches in other plant genomes. Yeah, because if these are conserved between different plants, that means they must be important somehow for, for, the, um, for the plant to survive. Yeah, so we uh, do homology searches of these six-frame translations against other plant genomes. And um, so these are quite diverse. They go from Arbidopsis to, to maize and, and rice. Um, so what you see here is maybe a bit complicated figure. So here's the, the peptide length. And then here is a, a bit score that is a score for how similar uh, the peptides are in this other genome. So we see even quite a lot of hits or you know, similar uh, parts uh, of the genome in uh, genomes that are as far away as wheat. Yeah? So we see tomato, rice, so, etc. So we have quite some evidence that some of these peptides uh, are indeed conserved over long uh, evolutionary times. Um, now normally what we do is to not just measure the similarity, but compare uh, how many mutations there are between those two uh, pieces of genome that are synonymous, so that do not change the amino acid, and that are non-synonymous. And this DNDS ratio um, gives a, a measure of selection on these open reading frames. 
Yeah, so if this ratio is smaller than one, there are fewer non-synonymous mutations than synonymous than we would expect. And that means there is a selective pressure to keep the amino acid sequence the same yeah, between those genomes. So here we have a distribution of the length of our stress-induced peptides. Most of them are uh, around uh, 35 amino acids. And we see that a lot of those have a selection pressure because the DNDS is much smaller um, than one. Um, so in total, we, we collected like uh, 144 uh, transcriptionally active regions, again, not overlapping with anything that was annotated before, and um, translated those into putative peptides. And in the end, we have uh, 159 stress-induced peptides with, um, with a significant selective pressure on them, so with a DNDS that is smaller than one. Um, so the, the RNA expression and the sequence conservation over these long evolutionary timescales suggest indeed that these short ORFs uh, are functional. But now, you know, what do they do? This is a big question. So in order to be able to communicate about these peptides, uh, we need some kind of um, coordinate system or database. Because normally, if you talk about the Arbidopsis gene, then you, know, you go to the Arbidopsis database, and there you have the whole annotation and, and gene IDs, etc. But since these are not annotated in the genome, we need something else. So we made um, an Arapeps database. So these are the Arbidopsis peptides. And um, so we give them uh, identifiers, and they're linked to the transcriptionally active regions, and the peptide sequence, and also this DNDS, and the, and the length is in there. And now we can easily communicate with our collaborators about these peptides and say, you know, we want to know more about this uh, BIP16 and uh, know what is the effect, for example. Um, so we, we also connected the genome browser to that so that you can easily see you know, these transcriptionally active regions and the, and the putative encoded peptides in the context of the, of the genome annotation version 10 here of, the, of, of Arbidopsis. Um, just to, to, and here you see the uh, stress-induced transcription profile by RNA sequencing, just to make communication easier between us and, and our collaborators, and also if other people are interested um, to work on these peptides, they can, of course, uh, go here and, and have a look at that. All right. So, in, so we did not only put our peptides in there that we, that we collected from this stress-induced data, um, but also peptides that were identified to be involved in morphogenesis in a study uh, by Hanada and co-workers in 2013, and then some unannotated secreted peptides. So those are peptides that contain a signal uh, a sequence to be secreted from the plant uh, from a study in 2006. Uh, and so all of these have transcription evidence, either by tiling arrays or by RNA sequencing. And in total, we have 13, over 13,000 putative peptides yeah, that have transcriptional evidence. Now, of course, it's impossible to screen all of, the, all of those for uh, some activity. Um, so, the first thing that we did is to cluster everything that is similar to each other. Yeah? Um, so, what you do is uh, uh, calculate the similarity be pairwise between all of the peptides and, um, and do a clustering using a Markov chain uh, clustering. Um, so, what we see here is that um, there is one cluster that contains more than 50 peptides that are very similar to each other, um, but there is also a lot of clusters where there's only two peptides uh, together. 
So there in total 1,300 clusters, and 21 of those clusters contain the stress-induced peptides that we are studying. Um, so then, in order to, to understand a bit more about what these peptides are doing, um, we cannot use classical protein uh, annotation techniques. We cannot use PFAM or, or this kind of things because you know, those do not contain patterns for, for short peptides. But what we can do is to look at prosite patterns. And um, these are just shorter motifs, and we can try to identify those in our peptides. So here we see uh, the type of motifs that we can retrieve in the peptides, um, like uh, nuclear localization signal or emidation. This looks like an N glycosylation, although we do not really know if a peptide would actually be modified like that. Um, this is an, an interesting cluster uh, of peptides. There are 27 uh, quite similar peptides in there. And one of those is a stress-induced peptides from our data. And the others are in other places in the genome. And if we do... Uh, so all, all of these are found in unannotated intergenic regions of Arbidopsis thaliana. And some of them also have homologs uh, in Arbidopsis lurata, suggesting that indeed these are conserved in evolution. Now this OSIP uh, 96.3 that is here in the alignment is uh, located in a transcriptionally active region uh, identified by tiling arrays. And uh, under oxidative stress, it has this uh, induction and also purifying selection. Now, what is interesting about it is that we find an AGC kinase docking motif in this peptide and in the linear motif database that's registered like this. So it's a, a lot of um, hydrophobic residues uh, in there. Um, now, what is... Um, what is AGC kinase? AGC kinases are a group of kinases in plants, and they are important. Uh, there's one master regulator that is PDK1, and one of the kinases in that group is Oxy1 that regulates uh, oxida the oxidative stress response. Um, the binding of uh, other AGC kinases to P PDK1 um, results in inactivation of that kinase. And um, so this uh, interaction between PDK1, Oxy1 is implicated in oxidative stress signaling. Now, if this OSIP963 is binding to this uh, PDK1, it may modulate you know, how this, the, this oxidative stress uh, responds. Yeah, so the, the binding motif uh, may result in binding to the, to the PIF uh, pocket of PDK1 kinase. So this is uh, an overview of how um, uh, how these uh, AGC, what these AGC kinases uh, look like in total, and there is um, there is some uh, um, th this activation segment that is important. Now, what we did is we took the portion of this peptide of this short peptide that contained the uh, AGC kinase uh, binding uh, motif and dock that into the PIF pocket of PDK1. And we could see, so this is an initial docking, and we, we could see that indeed it, it fits quite nicely um, into this uh, pocket. So these are the uh, interactions in there. Um, so we could optimize this docking. Um, so this is a refined docking of that. So we can see that indeed this portion of the peptides fits very nicely into this uh, pocket of the of the PDK1 um, kinase. So what we 
so li like I said, these AGC kinases are activated um, by loops of other kinases going into this pocket, and we think that this peptide may have a similar role in activating um, this kinase. Um, so this is a picture that I borrowed from the Rosetta Design Group. So here you see peptide-mediated protein-protein interactions. Um, so here is one protein and another protein, and here is one loop uh, of, of one of the proteins that is going into a binding pocket of this other one. And these kind of peptide-mediated protein interactions are used in drug design to uh, design peptides that actually go into such pockets uh, to interfere with such uh, interactions. Um, so in, in, in pharma, the people design inhibitory peptides that then interfere with such interactions. So maybe plants have designed their own drugs and have made uh, peptides that actually do the same. I think it's quite uh, plausible that that has happened. Um, so uh, to continue the story, we think that there may be more peptides that function in this way, yeah, that interfere with protein-protein interactions uh, by binding uh, to such uh, pockets. Um, so what we did is to, uh, to look for three-dimensional structures and scan if we can find uh, more of these protein-peptide pairs where uh, so, uh, one of our peptides could bind uh, in a pocket of a, of a protein. And then uh, using um, docking and uh, uh, modeling optimization, see uh, if that actually properly uh, would bind. And in total, we're, we're on to 10 protein peptide pairs, of course, from our thousands of peptides, there's still not much, but I think it's a start to try and understand what these peptides are actually doing. Um, there's another interesting cluster, I hope I still have a little bit of time, um, that, um, that we found. So this is again a, a, a cluster of peptides, nine peptides that are quite similar to each other. Um, that are involved in stress response, and they are similar to uh, uh, FLP peptides in metazoans. And these peptides have a role in um, osmoregulation via the regulation of ion channels. And so in 2014, there was a report that Arbidopsis, Arbidopsis also expressed some genes that display uh, repeated sequences that end in an RF. So it's um, likely that also in plants these FLPs could uh, be involved in physiological processes. So how does this work? Um, you have a, a, a longer peptide first with a, with a lot of these repeats inside and then there is a cleavage um, right after these uh, lysine arginine uh, pairs, and then you have a resulting very short uh, peptides. Um, so here in in our cluster, we also have uh, stress-induced peptides, and then um, some other peptides from Arabidopsis lirata. So so these are homologous, if you want. And they have these repeats of arginine, phenylalanine, uh, and um, so we also expect that these are cleaved and result in these very short um, peptides. Now, what they would do exactly, we we still do not know. But we know that uh, what you can see here is the um, expression of this part of the genome under normal conditions, and then in oxidative stress, you get. Uh, expression of this extra part, so here in green and in red. And um, um, so, so yeah, we think that indeed in oxidative stress you get induction of this, uh, of this protein and, and resulting in these very short peptides being expressed. Okay, so to sum up, 
um, my story about short peptides, uh, many of them uh, feature negative selection that points at functionality, yeah, because we have similar sequences in other plant genomes. Um, there are some clusters of similar sequences, uh, maybe similar to, to protein families or peptide families in this case. Um, they have similarity to, to parts of known proteins or binding motifs. Maybe they interfere with, uh, with peptide-mediated protein-protein interactions. That could be one of the molecular mechanisms of these peptides. And then we see this novel family of FLP peptides also in plants. All right, so I would really like to thank the students in my group, especially uh, Rashmi, is my PhD student, who's done the most part of this work on the plant peptides. And then um, we're trying to uh, follow up this uh, AGC kinase story uh, together with the um, group of Remco Offringa in, in Leiden plant development. And uh, the RNA-seq and tiling array data was generated together with the group uh, plant-fungi interactions uh, in Leuven. And then I want to just, so this is my group. <laughs> and I want to point you to this uh, conference on challenges in data integration, um, where I'm also speaking in November. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Vera. I think we have opening for a question. Yes, Shetil. Yes, uh, since um, these peptides obviously are not annotated in, in the genome, this means that there are quite a bit of genes then, since, since there are numerous uh, that are not. So, so in other words, Arabidopsis have many more genes that we have actually anticipated if you're talking about hundreds of different peptides. But I'm kind of wondering why, why do plants have such so many of these peptides? Do we know anything about that? What, what well, so uh, some of them could be defensins. So the defensins have been described, right? These are secreted, sh sh very short proteins uh, with some cysteines uh, inside that form cysteine bridges, and they have antimicrobial activity. Yeah. So this is actually a large uh, family of of the peptides. Those are. As I would say on the larger side. Some of those have been annotated. But really, I think Arbidopsis is not the only organism that has these short peptides. They have been overlooked in all or organisms because of the low signal-to-noise ratio. Even in bacteria, we see that. I think we will see that in human genome, we also have peptides encoded. Um, we just haven't started to, to really mind that. I think there are few reports but we haven't started to do that uh, systematically. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thank you for the uh, nice talk. Um, I have a question regarding um, the evidence for these putative peptides. If I, as far as I understood it, it's mainly on transcriptome beta level. Um, I was wondering, are you planning to do uh, riboprofiling for these? Or yeah. Yes, we are, we are planning to, to, to not do ribosec ourselves, but to mine ribosec data to see if we find ribosomes um, translating them. Uh, the plant fungi interactions group um, has also tried, we have made a lot of effort to try and do peptidomics uh, by mass spectrometry, but these, it's very hard. Um, to actually identify those short peptides by mass spec, um, uh, yeah, because they do not do not always have lysines and arginines, and they don't have triptych peptides, and or they don't fly, or they're very hydrophobic. Um, so yeah, we're looking into um, collecting evidence from ribosec. Yeah. Was there one more question? Yeah, thank you. I think we have room for one more. We have room for one more. Peter? <laughs> okay, 
Hello. I was just going to th thanks, by the way, for a very, very clear talk. That was lovely. I was just going to ask, can you use your knowledge of the binding motifs for the <clears throat> peptides to help with drug discovery for blocking ligand binding sites in, in other in mammalian organisms, like human, for example? I mean, is there any reason that that knowledge of that, that you're learning from these peptides can't be translated into? No, you know? there's no reason that it cannot be translated. Yeah, but so these, so the peptide-mediated protein interactions are already being used, but you can also, uh, so this is a project that I, you know, I've written a proposal for and so <laughs> that I want to do, is to actually find uh, pockets in proteins, where well, of course we need 3D structures, right? But if you can find the pockets computationally, then you can also design peptides that would bind there. Okay, thank you very much once more, Vera, and a small gift from the organizers. Thank you. Thank you. Power back. I don't think I'm allowed to take it on the floor. Okay. okay. Uh, we are a little bit behind schedule, but uh, that will be all fine. We meet here again in 15 minutes, 10.45. We proceed with the program, and in the meantime, it's coffee back stage, back behind these doors. Okay, everybody, if you can find your seats, and then we will proceed. So uh, our next speaker will be one of the six research projects currently running in our center, and it will be Dr. Alexander Wenzel, who is a former colleague of mine, I should mention, and he's a senior research scientist at Sintef in Trondheim. His expertise is in functional metagenomics, enzyme technology, and systems and synthetic biology. And the title of Alexander's presentation today will be New Bioactive Compounds from Environmental Microbial Resources by an Integrated Functional Metagenomics Approach. So please, Alexander. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Trick, for the kind uh, introduction. And I'm really happy to be here and present uh, what we're doing in connection to the Center for Digital Life. Um, I have uh, set up this portfolio because we have, uh, there is a, there's the In Biofarm project, which is the Center for Digital Life project, which I'm leading. But it has a very close connection to an ERA SysApp project, which I'm also coordinating on the systems biology of Streptomyces silicolor. Uh, plus, at, uh, I was, that I was also involved in a former SUSMO project, which is a very important systems biology background for the InBioFarm project. Plus, that we have a strategic project in Sintef on functional metagenomics, which, uh, which prepares a very nice and good basis on, as, on, uh, on a really large number of bacterial genomes, um, which feeds into in the InBioFarm project. Um, we, the overall arcing topic of uh, what we do is, uh, is the urgent need for new natural product discovery. And uh, as you see on this curve here, there is, a, there, there is an urgent need to, uh, to, to tackle the challenge of antibiotic resistance because the, the, the antibiotic resistant bacteria are on the rise, while at the same time the discovery of new bioactive compounds, uh, new antibiotics, uh, is on the fall. So there has been very limited efforts to develop new antibiotics, in particular by the big pharmaceutical industry. And uh, there's also a very high rate of rediscoveries, uh, so that uh, you always discover the, the same, the same uh, compounds again and again. So that makes it really tedious to get something new out of it. So, and then there's, there's of course, uh, also a lot of uh, other um, diseases that need to, be, uh, need to be addressed by new natural products. And uh, so there's a, there's a pressing societal need to have new um, uh, technology uh, to, uh, to efficiently produce, uh, find and produce new natural products. Um, marine bioprospecting uh, has been a very long-term effort by Sintef and NTNU, and uh, it, uh, it has been for ongoing for, for many years, and uh, antimicrobials, anti-cancer compounds has been one of the topics, but of course there's a lot of other products that can be derived from the marine environment. And, uh, in fact, um, there is a large collection of marine uh, actinobacteria 
um, which uh, which come from uh, from uh, the the marine environment of the Trondheim Fjord, and this is uh, this is what we. Um, what we what we work on. So it's a, the the majority of, of of natural products for medical use they still come from this class of bacteria, uh, and several other compounds uh, with different applications in medicine. So this this the machinery for producing these natural products uh, is encoded in so-called gene clusters, which here are BGCs, uh, like here this example for the vancomycin, which is a very important last resort antibiotic, and um, so. Um, this is a kind of a general feature that you have like, clustered genes in a very large chunk of DNA, and uh, all, the all the machinery is encoded in these gene clusters. Um, some uh, examples for compounds that have actually have been isolated from uh, from the strain collection of the Trenums fjord by classical bioprospecting. This is, for example, this macrolactam uh, antibiotic, which is, a, which is an antifungal function. Uh, this ring structure here, which is a, a, a strong anti-gram positive bacterial um, uh, antibiotic, and uh, their respective gene clusters. You see uh, again here that these genes are all clustered in these, uh, these gene clusters. <laughs> So, but of course, uh, what we want to do is we want to go beyond uh, what we can do by classical bioprospecting. And uh, what we do, what we already do, is we, we target environmental niches like the marine environments, which haven't been exploited that much yet. Um, but we want to also go for all these gene clusters, which is by estimate about more than 80%, which are not expressed in the natural bacteria uh, under laboratory conditions. And we, of course, target in the end also to have the more than 95% of the bacteria in nature which cannot be cultivated at all uh, in the laboratory uh, using standard techniques. So um, to get all this going, we need to have uh, new technology to be developed. We need to have technology to clone complete uh, biosynthetic gene clusters. We need to have host strains that actually can express these biosynthetic gene clusters and form um, the, the compounds. And we need to have um, bioactivity screening at a high throughput and also the possibility to elucidate the structures of these new compounds. So there's a lot of technology that's needed and th all this is, is included into the um, the in biofarm biodiscovery platform, which we are building up in the Center for Digital Life, uh, it takes the basis in the marine actinobacteria strain collections that we have at Sintef and NTNU. We have sequence in a Sintef internal project. Uh, uh, right now, about a thousand genomes of these actinobacteria. Um, we are currently analyzing these using bioinformatics methods in order to group these, uh, try to see which of these biosynthetic gene clusters, let's say between 20 and 50 per genome, um, to, uh, to see where are actually new structures encoded. Um, we then um, develop technology to, um, to, to clone these gene clusters and transfer them into different expression hosts. We work on the side of the expression hosts using Streptomyces silicolor as a, as a model organism, um, so using a systems biology approach to optimize host strains to specifically or more efficiently produce heterologous biosynthetic gene clusters. And we complement this with high super technology for compound identification and activity evaluation uh, in the context of an integrated project. So the aim is in the end, of course, we start with the actinobacteria strain collection, but in the end we want to go for other strain collections out there, for example, at pharmaceutical partners. Uh, we want to go for environmental metagenomes and we want to lead to accelerated biopharmaceutical innovation uh, on the biopharmaceutical market. Um, this is the partners, current partners in the InBioFarm projects, so Sintef and TNU. Uh, we have uh, two partners in the US and in the Netherlands and uh, in Germany, uh, advisors in Germany. And uh, as I said, this is a, a project financed by the Research Council of Norway. 
So what do we have so far? We have been sequencing, as I said, about a thousand of these actinobacteria genomes. Um, uh, it shows that uh, this is just a 16S, uh, our RNA tree. So we see that there's a lot of actinobacteria of known uh, taxa in there, uh, but there's also some rare species here. So I don't want to go into detail. So we're, uh, you see that there's a, it's, it's, a, it's a big diversity that we can use as the basis. Um, we are using a bioinformatics tool, which is called AntiSmash. Uh, and one of the, the co-developers of this software uh, is actually uh, included in the consortium. Uh, and he, uh, he has developed this. And right now, we have a synthet researcher in Wageningen who is doing, uh, do is doing the analysis of these 1,000 genomes uh, together with him. This is the first uh, result, uh, how this looks like. This is for just for 214 genomes. You see like, this is the strains, 214 14 strains. And you have biosynthetic gene clusters, different biosynthetic gene clusters listed up here. So this is a heat map of novelty of biosynthetic gene clusters. And once we have this set up for 1,000 genomes, we make an evaluation and take out those strains, 100 to 200, which we are most interested in and which have the, the, novel, uh, the, the most novel uh, biosynthetic gene clusters included. Of course, then we have the gene clusters. We need to express them. Um, of course, we look into the strains, the original strains. If they already express these, then we are lucky. But in most cases, they will not be able to do that. So we need to clone the gene clusters. There's two ways to do that, actually. Um, one is a, just a random fragmentation of the genomes, cloning them into large insert bags, and, uh, and then preparing an E. coli library. But we are also working together with a company called Virgin Biosciences in the US um, to, make a, to, to develop a technology to specifically take out uh, a defined gene cluster in its entirety and clone it directly. And if that works, uh, we, of course, we will have a very big advantage and have the possibility to, to clone many, many gene clusters uh, in, in parallel. So, but this, it's, not, it's not decided yet, so we are going both ways right now, random cloning and the targeted cloning. And then, of course, we need to have the, uh, the transfer technology um, in order to use uh, different hosts uh, to take up these libraries uh, in order to make an expression and an evaluation of what we actually get. So Streptomyces silicolor, just a few words. It's a, our model organism. It produces a lot of bioactive compounds itself, um, but it's a, it's a very nice uh, established model, and uh, all the the molecular biology technologies are in place. Um, it has been studied, as I said, in this SUSMO project called STREAM. There is a metabolic switch from primary phase to secondary metabolite production phase. And this, uh, this region here has been studied on a systems biology level um, using this classical systems biology circle where you have a, you have a model, uh, you have make make uh, perturbations based on uh, predictions from this model, generate cell mass, sample, produce data uh, to, uh, to, 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 um, to optimize the model, to refine the model. And in our case, of course, the aim was to ultimately control the secondary metabolism of streptomyces silicolor. We have developed a cultivation system which is highly reproducible, so this is three uh, controlled fermentations would say that Streptomyces silicolor is not growing as single cells, but as a mycelium, more like a fungal fungus. Uh, and you see here, uh, this is a run of a fermentation. You see that um, it produces three different colored um, antibiotics. And uh, you see that in different phases, first the, the yellow starts, then the red fades in, and then the um, then, the, then the blue one, and this is in, in, in relation, for example, to a phosphate depletion. We see that there is a production of, uh, of antibiotics. Um, on the transcriptome level, you can see the switching as well. You see that once at 35 hours the phosphate is depleted. You see that there's a lot of things going on. Uh, the phosphate regulon is going on. Uh, there's the ribosomal genes partly going down. But you see in particular this red and ACT, which is like two of the main antibiotics being produced by silicolor, um, that we have first the red coming up and then the act coming up. And in this study, with a high resolution time series, we managed to actually look into the different stages of regulatory switching in this organism in order to understand actually what, the, uh, uh, yeah, what is actually um, the reason and the, 
the, the status of the cell in order to produce the different antibiotics. So now we are continuing this both in the SysDirect project in era SysApp and in the InBioFarm project actually as well um, to look into different aspects of Streptomyces silicolor, including the morphology, including gene regulatory network, nitrogen metabolism and precursor supply and all these are important uh, when it comes to an efficient um, production of, of antibiotics of different classes and uh, the aim is to produce a set of synthetic superhosts that are able to produce certain classes of antibiotics in a more efficient way so that we can use them in a panel of different um, um, superhosts hosts to express biosynthetic gene clusters. So um, when it comes to MS um, we are of course in parallel uh, building um, high throughput methods to evaluate, to structurally determining um, the compounds that are being produced. And this can be both on the actinobacteria culture itself, from the marine actinobacteria, or from the strains, from the super strains, which have a hard heterologous cluster. Um, we have uh, different technologies which we are kind of uh, evaluating in parallel right now, which have a high resolution, um, and uh, like high resolution is the aim, and in particular also short time for each analysis. So we're going down to 10 seconds with the rapid fire QTOF analysis method. And if you have thousands of clones uh, to screen, then of course you need to have very efficient MS based and automated um, uh, technologies. So in the end, of course, we produce MS data, fragmentation data, and you get structural information, and you get, in particular, um, an idea if you're actually producing something, something novel. So we have the workflow, establish a workflow where we integrate the anti-smash, which is set this prediction based on just the genome sequence or the biosynthetic gene cluster sequence, and the MS-based analysis where we have MS profiling both with and without fragmentation and we're running different um, different uh, scripts for uh, for uh, for network building in order to see if uh, if the masses which we retrieve are actually belong are registered in some database or not um, even fragments of those so this integration we think is is really promising and we have um, here as one example from one of the thousand isolates that we have um, where we have done um, both the anti-smash analysis, we have run MS1 and MS2, and uh, done a, a, a multi-omics integration using a program which is called Data Warrior. And uh, this, uh, there you see that you have different compounds coming up using these different, um, these different uh, technologies. And if you integrate all of these, they, you see that they kind of group together. And you see that, for example, antimycin uh, is, is discovered both by MS2 and MS1. Uh, this one is by MS1 and by anti-smash. Uh, it doesn't work all the time because here's, for example, the antimycin predicted from the anti-smash. It's somewhere else than here. So there, there's still some things that need to be curated. And it might also be uh, registration errors in the, in, the, in, the, in the databases being discovered like this. So, um, so but this is, this is kind of the approach we want to, uh, we want to use in, uh, in a set of 100 to 200 of those. And uh, of course, we also have bioactivity screening then on, uh, because we want to know if we really have antibiotics. So this is kind of integrated as a, as a, as a, as a, yeah, in different places. Um, so in the, in the, in the platform, so that we actually uh, know exactly if we have an antibiotic or if we have an anti-cancer compound or uh, whatever I have. So um, all this put together into this InBioFarm platform um, uh, brings me then to the end uh, with the acknowledgements and collaborators and funders. As I said, it's, uh, we have a, it's a big team right now already. Uh, the InBioFarm uh, is, is more on the left side here. This is kind of the InBioFarm consortium. This is the Aerosys app consortium. Some providers uh, of libraries um, and uh, bioinformatics, um, which, uh, which, we, uh, which we also have, have included here. And uh, I would like to thank the Research Council uh, and the Center for Digital Life for all the funding. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexander, for an impressive talk. We have time for one question, if anyone has. Yes, there is one on the back. Actually, it's two questions, but... <laughs>
Um, the first one is, uh, how many of these natural, marine natural products have you already isolated and purified compounds from? In other words, you know, for example, I have zebrafish models that I'd love to test uh, using your extracts. Uh, but ultimately, the question is, how complex are these extracts? And do you have the equivalent purified molecules, i.e. at least subfractions? Uh, and the second one is, are you still open to collaboration? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, OK, so the, 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 of course, these MS extracts, they are very complex. Of course, in particular, when we have the original strains. Yeah, because there are multiple, multiple clones, uh, multiple gene clusters that are involved. Um, once we go into our superhost, we know the background. If we put in a specific Bars gene cluster, we know that any new mass com coming up needs to be related to this gene cluster. So this, this, this simplifies it. And in addition, uh, on, the, on the original strains, the integration of the anti-smash, like the bioinformatics prediction of, uh, of a certain mass, and the MS data, MS1 and MS2 data, uh, reduces complexity enormous, and we get specific masses when we, which we can target, for example, in fractionation uh, for bioactivity screening. And of course, we are still open for collaboration. Okay. We can uh, talk afterwards. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander. We have a present.